Hello everyone, a very good morning and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Welcome to the daily Hindu news analysis. For today's discussion, I have chosen five important articles from the Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper. As you know, usually the Sunday newspaper doesn't have enough material for our exams. So we have just five articles, but trust me, all the five articles are very, very important. I have chosen two important articles for a detailed discussion, which is very important for your mains. Of course, it will be relevant for your prelims as well, but these articles are largely mains oriented articles. Then we have four more articles. Sorry, it's total of six articles, not five. So we have four more articles for your prelims. So let's cover these topics comprehensively so that you don't have to go back and read the newspaper again. If you guys are liking the initiative, do support us by pressing the like button, share these videos with other aspirants and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Also head to our telegram channel after the session ends because we have a quiz on these topics that will help you revise these articles again. The link for the telegram channel is provided in the description box of this video. So let's begin with today's discussion by looking at this important column from page number 12. The topic that it deals with is relevant for social justice under GS paper 2. This column is specifically focused upon the PVTGs, particularly vulnerable tribal groups, abbreviated as PVTGs. So in this discussion, we should understand everything about PVTGs. First, we'll look at the context, why this tribal group is in news. We'll understand who are PVTGs, why are they classified separately from other scheduled tribes, what is their population in India, where are they distributed, what challenges do they face, and is there any welfare scheme that the government has launched to promote the development of these tribal communities. This is something we'll cover in complete detail. So first, the context. Why are PVTGs in news? They are in news because of two reasons. Recently, the Tribal Affairs Ministry submitted data to the Rajya Sabha regarding PVTG population in the country. And according to this report that the Tribal Affairs Ministry has shared with the Rajya Sabha, the population of PVTGs has not been in decline. This was shared just a few days ago on the 6th of December. But however, the writer of the column is pointing out that this data, which the Tribal Affairs Ministry has presented to the Parliament based on census data, is in contradiction to what the same ministry had earlier shared with the Parliament. Last year, in 2022, the Tribal Affairs Ministry had shared state-wise census data with the Parliament, with a specific parliamentary panel that looks into tribal affairs and tribal welfare. And in this data, the Tribal Affairs Ministry had stated that the numbers of the PVTG tribal group has gone down by 40% in the first decade of this century. At least in nine specific states and union territories, the population of PVTGs had seen a decline of at least 40% in the first decade of this century, according to the Tribal Affairs Ministry. So now the Tribal Affairs Ministry is contradicting itself. So there is a difference in the data that the ministry is presenting to the parliament. So this is the concern being flagged by the writer of this column. And also recently, just last month on the 15th of November, Prime Minister Modi launched a very, very important scheme, the PM Jan Man scheme. It stands for Pradhan Mantri Janjati Adivasi Nyaya Maha Abhiyan. It was launched on the important date of 15th November. 15th November is marked as Janjatiya Divas, a day to commemorate the contribution of tribal communities to highlight their issues and concerns. Because this is the birth anniversary of Bisra Munda, the popular tribal leader who rebelled against British colonial rule. So on this historic day, the government of India celebrates Janjatiya Divas and on this occasion, Prime Minister Modi launched a dedicated development mission which is aimed specifically at PVTGs. So it's because of these recent developments that 
PVTGs are in news. You can expect prelims questions on PVTGs and you can also expect a detailed mains question. So let's understand in detail who exactly are PVTGs. Why should the government pay more attention to them? Where are they distributed? What is their population? What concerns are they facing? That is something we should understand. Now, as you know, India has a significant tribal population. India is home to a significant tribal population distributed across different parts of India, especially in central and eastern parts of India, northeastern part of India, southern parts of India, and even few western, northwestern parts of India. So across the country, we do have a strong tribal population, which accounts for nearly 8.6% of India's total population. This is the composition of all the scheduled tribes in the country. We have more than 700 notified scheduled tribes. So their total population accounts for around 8.6% of the total population of the country. Now within the ST category, there are few tribal groups which are most vulnerable. Scheduled tribes are already considered as a vulnerable community because of their isolation, their backwardness and their historical oppression and discrimination as well that the communities have faced. Now within the ST category, there are a set of few tribal groups which are separately categorized as PVTGs because they represent the most vulnerable tribal groups within the ST category. Is that clear? So these communities, because of their isolation, remoteness, backwardness, they need greater focus and attention from the government in order to look after their socio-economic needs. They need dedicated funds. They need special focus in governance in order to provide for the upliftment of these communities. Now let's look at the background to this classification. When was this classification done and how many tribal groups are present and where are they distributed? It was in 1973 that the Debar Commission recommended that some of the most vulnerable tribal groups, they have to be separately categorized as primitive tribal groups. This was the earlier classification. So based on recommendations of Debar Commission, the government of India notified the PTGs or primitive tribal groups, which constituted the less developed amongst all the tribal groups. In 1975, 52 such tribal communities were recognized across the country and added separately into this list. Now, this categorization has been renamed in 2006 and PTGs became PVTGs. So, PVTG now stands for Particularly Vulnerable Tribal Groups. And in 1993, 23 additional tribes were added to the list. So, today, we have a total of 75 particularly vulnerable tribal groups in India. Out of the total 705 scheduled tribes, these 75 tribal groups in particular, they have been separately categorized as PVTGs because they suffer from various socio-economic challenges. Of course, there is a certain criteria which is used by the government to classify the PVTGs. These PVTG communities, they are often marked by a homogeneous population. These tribal groups, they are located in remote, inaccessible parts of the country and the population size is very small. They usually don't interact much with other communities. They don't marry with other communities. So these are largely homogeneous groups with a relatively smaller population and usually their population is on the decline or it could be stagnant. This is one important criteria which is used by the government to recognize PVTGs. Apart from that, these communities are technologically backward and economically backward. Since they are located in remote, inaccessible areas, they are deprived of basic infrastructure. They don't have access to clean water, electricity or even basic facilities like homes and roads, power, etc. So as a result, the literacy levels are very low. Physically, these communities are isolated from the rest of the country. 
they are kept away from the mainstream. Their economic development is also compromised because they rely on pre-agrarian technology. They haven't adopted modern forms of agriculture. They are also largely disconnected from the digital world. They don't have mobile internet connectivity. Their health parameters are very poor. In fact, many of the tribal groups, which are classified as PVTGs, they are very prone to several diseases and disorders, which is, which is a major threat for the very existence of the tribal group. In fact, some of the PVTGs are on the verge of extinction as well. Is that clear? So they represent a slower rate of change. They are characterized by economic backwardness, remoteness and physical isolation and a declining or stagnant population which represents a threat to the community. This could even weaken their culture and their identity because many of these tribal groups, they speak their native indigenous languages which doesn't have a written script. So for tribal communities, language is very crucial. It's an integral part of their cultural identity. So given the various threats that these tribal groups face, socially, economically, culturally. They deserve to be classified separately and they deserve dedicated attention from the government in order to provide for the upliftment of these communities. It's on these grounds that the Debar Commission recommended the classification of the most vulnerable tribal groups into a separate category. So initially, the group was known as primitive tribal groups. Now it has been renamed as PVTGs. Is that clear? Now, coming to the next point, a very important point. Where can you find PVTGs in India? This could be turned into a prelims question. These 75 tribal groups, which have been notified under the PVTG category, they are distributed across 18 states and union territories. Is that clear? According to a book published by the Anthropological Survey of India, the highest concentration of PVTGs can be found in the state of Odessa. Odessa is home to 15 PVTG communities, followed by other major states like Andhra Pradesh, Bihar and Jharkhand, Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh, Tamil Nadu, Kerala and Gujarat. These states have at least five or more PVTG groups. Then you have Maharashtra, West Bengal, Karnataka, Uttarakhand and Rajasthan, Tripura and Manipur with smaller groups of PVTG communities. If you look at Andaman Nicobar Islands, for example, all the four major tribal groups found in Andaman Nicobar are classified as PVTGs. Is that clear? The Sentinelese, Nicobaris, all the four major tribal groups in Andaman Nicobar are categorized under PVTG classification. So this is the distribution of PVTGs in India. Please look at this important map that I have shared over here. It gives you an idea about their population and distribution. According to government data, which is based on the last available census of the communities, based on 2001 census, the total population of 75 PVTG stands at around 27.6 lakh. That's around 2.7 million, right? The highest number can be found in Odessa. You can clearly see in the map, Odessa has the highest concentration and the highest number as well. There are 15 PVTG tribal groups and they stand, the population stands for around 8.66 lakhs. Followed by Madhya Pradesh, even Andhra Pradesh, Jharkhand, they all have a significant distribution of PVTGs. And you can clearly see here in the map and understand the distribution of these communities. So coming to the next point, the government has often brought out few reports in the past decades highlighting the socio-economic backwardness of the PVTG community. Their small number, their small population size in itself is a concern as I was pointing out. Along, along with that, these communities face economic backwardness, social backwardness. They are isolated from the rest of the country. They are largely removed from the mainstream of, of the society. That is the reason why they need special attention. They need to be classified as the most vulnerable group. 
is that clear? This is the justification for giving special attention to PVTGs. Now, what is this scheme all about? The PM Janman scheme. What is the allocation? What is the aim of the scheme? What does it aim to do? What is the role of the central government and state governments in its implementation? How will it uplift the 75 tribal groups? That is something we need to understand before we end this discussion. The primary aim of PM Janman scheme launched on 15th November is to provide basic facilities to these tribal areas. As I told you, these communities are found in remote, inaccessible parts of the country. So to connect them with the rest of the country, to bring them back into mainstream, you need to extend basic infrastructure. That is the number one priority. So under the scheme, the government of India, in coordination with the concerned states and union territories, is planning to extend basic facilities like roads, power supply, construction of homes, pakka houses, mobile connectivity, etc. Is that clear? This also includes the provision of clean drinking water, piped water connections will be provided, better sanitation facilities along with improved education, healthcare and nutritional status that remains the focus of the scheme. And in fact, during this year's budget session, the government had already announced a PVTG development mission. The Pradhan Mantri PVTG development mission had been proposed in the budget session itself. So based on the budgetary proposal, the government has launched the PM Janman scheme. So PM Janman scheme is one component of the PM PVTG development mission. The development mission is a much broader agenda. So under that, the Janman scheme is one of the components. Now, please make a note of these important points regarding the scheme that I have given over here. The scheme will be implemented in more than 22,000 villages across these 18 states and union territories with focus being the protection and nurturing of the PVTG communities. The scheme aims to safeguard these tribal communities, uplift them socially and economically, and also to protect their culture and their population. This is the primary objective of the mission and the government of India has allocated 24,000 crore rupees for this scheme. Is that clear? The overall outlay is more than slightly more than 24,000 crore rupees out of which the center will contribute. The center will contribute around 15,000 crore rupees. The rest 8,000 crore odd rupees will come from the respective state governments. So there is a funding ratio that is involved. It's a centrally sponsored scheme where the central government is taking the majority of the share with states also contributing a part of the budgetary outlay. Majority of these funds out of the total 24,000 crore rupees, almost 19,000 crore is being set aside for roads and houses. Providing road connectivity to these remote areas, to these remote habitations and building pakka houses for the tribal communities. That is the number one priority and almost 19,000 crore rupees, that is a good 60 to 70 percent of the funds has been allocated for construction of roads and construction of houses. So who will implement this scheme? It's not just the tribal affairs ministry. In fact, nine important ministries will be involved. These ministries include Ministry of Road Transport and Highways, Ministry of Rural Development and the others. All these ministries, they have a dedicated scheduled tribe component in their budget. So the funds will be assigned to the ST component of each of these ministries. It's not that Tribal Affairs Ministry will get all the funds and it will implement the entire scheme on its own. It's not like that. The design of the scheme is such that nine key ministries will be involved and the funds will be distributed into their ST component. So they will utilize these funds to provide for these basic facilities in order to improve the socio-economic status of the PVTG villages in the country. So that is the structure of the scheme. The government has even laid out specific targets under PM Janman scheme. It has 
clearly quantified the targets. Around 4.9 lakh pakka houses will be built under PM Avas Yojana. Around 8,000 kilometers of roads will be built in these remote areas. Mobile medical units will be set up for better access to healthcare. Piped water connection will be provided for clean drinking water. Anganwadi centers will be set up to provide for better health care and educational and nutritional requirements for women and children. Multipurpose centers and hostels will come up to improve education and also to serve a community purpose. Mobile connectivity will be extended and even vocational skill training centers will be set up to create livelihood opportunities to impart basic skills, livelihood skills and thus create livelihood, livelihood opportunities for these communities. One then Vikas Kendras will be set up to promote the trade of forest produce. As you know, tribal communities, they rely on collection and selling of minor forest produce. That is a part of their indigenous lifestyle. Tribal communities, they often collect the minor forest produce, which includes fruits and berries, rubber, honey, or even tobacco leaves, etc. And they either barter it for other goods or they sell it in the local markets. This is their traditional livelihood. So to sustain this market where minor forest produce is traded, the government will provide dedicated support through these one dan Vikas Kendras. Solar power will also be extended for street lighting and for providing off the grid solar electricity. So all such schemes will be implemented under the broader PM Janman scheme, which is a part of the PVTG development mission. But however, there are certain challenges that lie ahead. According to the column, the biggest challenge in the implementation of the scheme will be the lack of data that is available regarding the population of PVTGs in India and the extent of their backwardness. Even the government doesn't have enough data. It hasn't conducted enough surveys focused on PVTGs. Whatever reports it has brought out, it contains very limited data. Even in the decennial census, which is carried out, enough data has not been captured regarding PVTG population in the country and their backwardness. To implement any such targeted scheme, the government should first understand the beneficiaries. The government should clearly know who's the target, target audience. So it's very important to capture their population data from more than 22,000 plus villages and the government should accurately understand the requirements of these communities. Because this could vary from community to community, state to state, district to district, village to village. Maybe in some tribal village, schools are required. In some tribal village, roads are needed. So accordingly, the scheme has to be customized in its final implementation. To do that, data is crucial. For that, surveys or census needs to be conducted. So this is where the Tribal Affairs Ministry is still on the back foot. The Tribal Affairs Ministry has said, it has informed the Parliament that since 1951, no census has specifically captured data on PVTGs. So whatever data is available, it's largely based on estimates. It's based on very limited surveys that have been done. And from that data has been pulled and estimates have been given. So the population might actually vary. And it's not just the total population, population at each community level might be different and the government doesn't have enough data on this. Their backwardness, their requirements, regarding that the government doesn't have enough information. That is why the National Advisory Council under the then UPA government had advised in 2013 to conduct a separate census specifically for PVTG communities. So the writer is saying that this is the need of the R. Now that the government is prioritizing the development of PVTGs, it's very important to first bring out accurate and adequate data regarding these communities. The focus should be on capturing their population, not just the total population, but the population of each individual 75 PVTGs and the exact extent of their backwardness. So that remains a challenge and that is what the writer of the column is highlighting. So please be prepared for a detailed mains question 
on this topic. I have given a practice question at the end. So I suggest all of you try to write an answer so that you are thoroughly prepared for this topic. Now let's look at another important article from the same page, from page number 12. This article deals with the recent cyclone that hit the east coast of India. As you know, Cyclone Michong caused enormous devastation along the coastline of Tamil Nadu, particularly in the city of Chennai, and it made landfall in coastal Andhra Pradesh. So this cyclone has brought heavy rainfall over both Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh. So the article is raising a very important question. Why did Cyclone Michong bring so much rain? The rainfall it brought, not just in Andhra Pradesh, but also in Tamil Nadu, was quite intensive. It led to severe flooding incidents. It led to several related disasters in the region. There has been loss of life, loss of property and infrastructure. So why did this cyclone bring so much rain? How did the cyclone form? How did the cyclone intensify and eventually dissipate along the Coromandel coast? That is the question being raised by this article. So the topic is very, very important for geography and also for disaster management. So let's understand the basics of cyclone formation. And we'll also talk about the mechanics involved in cyclone intensification. How does a cyclone intensify? And what causes few cyclones to bring so much rainfall? Right? That is something we need to understand. A cyclone is essentially a vortex which is formed in the tropical areas. Generally, cyclone activity is seen in the tropical belt between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. So these tropical cyclones, they are known by different names in different parts of the world. But the mechanics of their formation, right? It's exactly the same around the world. A cyclone is essentially a closed circulatory system. It's a closed circulatory system of air currents. And when these cyclones, when they make landfall, the event where the eye of the cyclone moves over land, that event is called landfall, that brings tremendous high-speed winds, torrential rains and coastal flooding, which causes the disaster in the coastal areas. So how does this closed circulatory system get formed in the first place in seas and oceans? That is something we should, we should understand here. See, a cyclone is often compared by experts to an engine. Just like an automobile engine runs on a fuel, it's powered by a fuel. Similarly, a cyclonic system, a cyclonic vortex, which is a closed circulatory system, is also powered by a fuel, which is nothing but warm, moist air, which is constantly supplied from the surface of a sea or an ocean. For a cyclone to form in the tropical areas, there are few favorable conditions that are needed. I have listed out the favorable conditions here. First of all, you need a large sea surface, meaning you need a large water body, an open sea or an ocean. And the sea surface temperature should be higher than 26 to 27 degrees Celsius. When the sea surface temperature is warm enough, the air current present above it also gets heated up and pulls the moisture, the warm moisture is pulled up. And the warm moist air ascends, it keeps rising upwards. So that is a basic requirement. And this is what fuels the cyclonic system. The constant supply of warm moisture from the surface of the sea is what acts as a fuel to power a cyclonic system. Along with that, Coriolis force is another basic requirement to introduce the circulatory motion to create the cyclonic vortex. Coriolis force present on the surface of the earth is a vital requirement. This induces the direction as well to the circulation of a cyclonic system. I hope you know that cyclones circulate in two different directions in northern and southern hemisphere respectively. So Coriolis force and its direction has a role to play here. So please mention in the comments the direction in which a cyclone moves around in northern hemisphere and watched 
direction does it take in the southern hemisphere? Please read about the impact of Coriolis force on a cyclonic circulation and mention that in the comments below. Then you also need a small variation in the vertical wind speed, a pre-existing low pressure depression for the cyclonic circulation to take place and an upper divergence above the sea level system. These are five basic conditions needed in the tropical area for the formation of a cyclone. Now let's understand this with the help of this image. You can see a large op open water body here, a sea or a ocean is depicted. And if the sea surface temperature is high enough, about 26, 27 degrees Celsius, it provides a constant supply of warm, moist air. Essentially through evaporation, moisture, water vapor keeps rising up. So the air above it heats up as well. And this air, which is warm and moist right now, will rise up, it will ascend. And eventually it will cool down. It will cool down, it will condense to form dense clouds, dense rain bearing clouds and Coriolis force kicks into effect. So this area where the warm moist air is rising up to form these dense clouds becomes a low pressure center. It becomes a depression. So this low pressure center will now attract winds from the other high pressure areas around it. And as these high pressure winds rush into the depression, Coriolis force induces the direction and creates a cyclonic vortex, a closed circulatory system. So the high speed winds accumulate around it and the moisture keeps rising up. There is a constant supply coming from the sea surface and eventually you get your massive cyclonic system that takes shape. The center of the cyclone is called the eye, the eye of the cyclone or the storm which is a region of calm. That is hypothetically, if you are present at this region, at the eye of the storm, which is, a, which is the low pressure depression, you will not experience the torrential rains or the high speed winds. Rather, this is present in the circulatory system around it, which is built up around the eye of the storm. So this system keeps moving around the water body, keeps accumulating more moisture, forming more clouds, accumulating more high speed winds and eventually it hits the land mass. So the event where a cyclone passes over land, especially the eye of the storm, if it crosses over the land, that is called the landfall event. And this acts as a sudden arrest of the momentum of the cyclonic system. So now the high speed winds will gush in, causing enormous damage in the coastal areas. Wind speeds can hit 150 to 250, 280 kilometers per hour. It will uproot almost everything in its path, causing widespread destruction. It will bring torrential rainfall, causing flash floods, landslides. There could be a storm surge, a coastal surge as well, where the seawater gushes inland towards the coastal areas, causing coastal flooding in the affected area. So that is how it essentially turns into a disaster. Now, if you see the factors involved in cyclone intensification, why does a cyclone bring more rainfall, especially a cyclonic system like Wichong? Right, it, it brought record levels of rainfall and what's the reason behind it? The reason is very simple. It's all because of the intensification of the cyclone. Since we equated a cyclone to an engine and I told you that the warm sea surface is the fuel which is powering a cyclone. So the longer a cyclone spends time on the open sea surface, the more water vapor it will accumulate. This is what we call as intensification. So it's all about how much time the cyclonic system has been able to spend over the open sea or the ocean. Longer the time it has spent, more water vapor would have been accumulated, more warm, moist air would have been accumulated, which eventually condenses to form the dense rain bearing clouds and essentially brings more rainfall following a landfall event. That is the reason why we are saying that climate change is directly driving cyclone intensification around the world. Today, cyclones are more intense. They bring more rainfall. They cause more enormous damage compared to before. It's because due to global warming, the water bodies which absorb most of the heat, they are providing more moisture. They are supplying more water vapor which fuels the cyclone and leads to the intensification of the cyclonic systems. Is that clear? So in the case of Cyclone Michong, this was one of the key factors. 
the cyclone had spent enough time in the Bay of Bengal accumulating large quantities of moisture which brought heavy rainfall in Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh. The IMD has also pointed out that there was another factor which contributed to the intensification of Cyclone Michong. This was a geographical phenomena known as the Madden-Julian Oscillation. I am sure many of you would have studied this as part of your basic geography. So in the case of Cyclone Michong, Madden-Julian Oscillation, which is a weather anomaly, played a direct role in intensifying this cyclone. Along with the cyclone spending more time on the sea, where it accumulated more moisture, the Madden-Julian Oscillation system also had an impact. So what is Madden-Julian Oscillation? You can see that depicted over here in this image. Madden-Julian Oscillation, it consists of a pair of weather anomalies that moves eastwards around the world every one or two months. Every one or two months, there is this weather anomaly. It's a combination pair that moves in an eastward direction around the world. The leading side of this weather system brings dry weather. You can see here, you can see the Madden-Julian oscillation pair depicted in this image. You can see the system moving eastwards. The leading side over here creates sunny, dry weather. Whereas the trailing section, the second pair, the, the second component creates wet, rainy weather conditions. So that is how Madden-Julian oscillation influences weather. Is that clear? So when Cyclone Michong was taking shape in the Northern Indian Ocean, that is in Bay of Bengal, Madden-Julian oscillation system was present and it was the trailing side of the pair which was present here, which had an influence in causing more rainfall. The MGO weather anomaly near Cyclone Michong created the perfect conditions, the favorable conditions for more rainfall to occur. So all these factors are responsible for the intensification of Cyclone Michong, which brought enormous rainfall along the east coast of India. Of course, there are many other factors as well, because cyclonic systems are very complex weather systems. That's why forecasting them itself is a big challenge. Today, there have been rapid advances in weather forecasting models and in forecasting technology. So as a result, IMD and similar early warning agencies, they can provide very accurate estimates. But still, tracking these systems, estimating their intensification, giving alerts about the estimated rainfall, the wind speed, still remains a major challenge as far as early warning systems are concerned. Understood? So these are some basics that we can, we can uh, infer from this important article. So this completes my detailed discussion of the two big articles. Now let's take a quick look at the prelim section. We have four small articles that are important for from the perspective of various subjects, starting with environment and ecology. Look at this article on page number 11. The article refers to green sea turtles. The article is based on a recent scientific report that was published in a very popular journal, Scientific Reports. According to this new paper which has been published, climate change is already having an impact on the breeding and nesting patterns of green sea turtles. And because of global warming, the experts are predicting that the nesting range of green sea turtles is likely to expand because of a warmer climate. Because see, marine animals, they are very sensitive to temperature changes. Sea turtles in particular, they are extremely sensitive to changes in sea temperature. And as you know, the seas and the oceans, they act as a carbon sink they are witnessing a rise in temperature levels as they are absorbing most of the greenhouse gas emissions. So the rising sea surface temperature and the overall impact of global warming is causing these changes to happen in various important species. Green sea turtle is a threatened species by the way. You can see that in the image here, this beautiful species is listed as endangered on the IUCN red list. That is its conservation status, meaning it's a threatened species. 
on the sites convention that deals with trade of endangered species it is listed under appendix 1 which prohibits the international trade of this particular species so you can clearly understand how threatened the species is now if you look at the current range and distribution of green sea turtle it is primarily found in tropical subtropical areas around the world there are two distinct species of green sea turtles one is found in the Pacific and one in the Atlantic they are also found in the Indian Ocean region so across the three major oceans in the tropical subtropical belt this is where you find green sea turtles so now latest research is showing that global rise in temperatures is having an impact on the breeding and nesting patterns of green turtles and this could lead to further expansion of their range meaning they will seek out cooler waters which places these species under greater threat in fact studies have also established that the sex of their offspring is directly dependent on the incubation temperature these turtles they they wash ashore and they lay the eggs on the beach the incubation temperature is critical for determining the sex of the offspring so rise in temperature definitely has an impact on breeding and nesting patterns and you can clearly see how more and more species are getting affected by human induced climate change next on page 13 we have an article which is important for science and technology I am sure all of you would have heard about generative AI which has hit global headlines since last year ever since open AI launched chat GPT generative AI has become a global sensation the launch of chat GPT was nothing short of a landmark event in the field of science and technology I'm sure all of you would have used chat GPT or similar platforms that are built on large language models meaning they have been fed with large volumes of data these algorithms they have been trained on massive volumes of data so chat GPT and its similar other versions that have come out they represent a major leap in artificial intelligence I'm sure you would have used chat GPT to let's say write a fictional story write a poem or to complete your assignment or to attempt a test or to suggest a trip itinerary right so chat GPT can do wonders it learns from existing data that it is fed upon and primarily it provides you text based output but Google which is the competitor of open AI as you know open AI is partly owned by Microsoft all the other tech giants even they have entered this race and Google is making rapid advances in the field of generative AI Google has come out with a new generative AI platform called Gemini Google's Gemini is making a lot of news of late because it marks another leap forward within the world of generative AI if chat GPT and other similar models learnt only from text Google's Gemini learns not just from text but also from images and audio that is how advanced this AI algorithm is it will not only learn from the text based data input it will learn from available images audio visuals as well so imagine what this platform can do right it can provide output as well in the form of images audio text and even video if required so Google Gemini is making a lot of news and hitting the headlines because of its remarkable capability where it can understand data it can interpret data from audio files images and provide very specific outputs which is sought by the user of course there will be tremendous advantages that arise from this at the same time there could be number of drawbacks number of risks associated with such revolutionary technology so just know the basics what is Google Gemini what is a large language model what is generative AI 
These are the basics that you should be familiar with because UPSC tends to ask such basic science and technology questions. Now moving on, we have an important update from China. The Chinese economy is not looking good. China is currently under a deflationary trend since the last 14 to 18 months and latest data, inflation data is showing that China has seen a major deflation in the month of November. It's the fastest fall in consumer prices in three years. This clearly points out the challenges that the Chinese economy is facing. The CPI index, the consumer price index has dropped 0.5%. The farm gate or the factory gate deflation levels has fallen drastically and this is of great concern not just for China but the rest of the world as well because the global economy is heavily dependent on China's manufacturing potential. There is a slowdown which has happened in its housing market. I don't know if you know about this. China is facing a very disturbing trend. There are thousands and thousands of apartments, localities and even cities which are abandoned. These are brand new houses that have been built, but there is no one living in them. These are being referred to as ghost apartments, ghost cities and towns. There has been a complete mismatch in demand and supply in the housing market, which is having a huge impact on the Chinese economy. The debt burden has gone up at the local government level. Consumer demand has dropped. So all these are adverse developments for the Chinese economy and this could have a global impact, including on India because many countries have a great deal of import dependency on China. Several economies are dependent on China dominated supply chains, including the Indian economy. So that's why it's very important to keep track of the ongoing deflationary situation in the Chinese economy. Now coming to the last article for today, even this involves China. In the South China Sea, as you know, China has triggered multiple maritime disputes with several Southeast Asian countries. China is locked in a conflict with Vietnam over the Paracel group of islands. It has also claimed the entire Spratly group of islands, which brings China into dispute with Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, Brunei, and of course with Philippines as well. Now towards the Philippine Sea over here, towards the Philippine Sea, there is an important shoal called the Scarborough Shoal. This is disputed between China and Philippines. The Scarborough Shoal is controlled by China but claimed by Philippines. This dispute has been going on for many years and in fact in 2016 Philippines had even approached the permanent court of arbitration that is located at The Hague in Netherlands asking for its intervention. Because PCA and the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea, they are responsible for interpreting the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, the UN Clause. China has blatantly violated UN Clause provisions in raising these maritime claims, which threatens the integrity, sovereignty of all these countries. So in 2016, Philippines had filed a case against China at the PCA and the PCA ruled in favor of Philippines. This case was related to the sovereignty of Scarborough Shoal. It's one of the disputed shoals between China and Philippines. So over here, China has been unnecessarily aggressive with Philippines. Every now and then, China disrupts freedom of navigation. In fact, China has done the same with the other countries and other disputes as well. It has done the same with Vietnam, with Indonesia, right? It has disrupted the movement of ships it has targeted fishing vessels as well. The Chinese Navy, the PLA Navy and the PLA Coast Guard, they are very aggressive in this region. And China has even raised private militias. The Chinese Navy and Coast Guard have sponsored private Chinese militias as well to target foreign vessels. So they have threatened freedom of navigation, which is a international right guaranteed under international law. So China has disrupted the rules-based order and blatantly violated UN clause provisions. 
So the Permanent Court of Arbitration in 2016, it criticized China for breaking down the, the international rules and it had awarded Scarborough Shoal to Philippines. It had ordered China to hand over Scarborough Shoal to Philippines. But of course, China refused to follow the award. It has rejected the ruling of the PCA. Now, Scarborough Shoal is in news here because Philippines has alleged that its vessels were targeted by Chinese boats by using water cannons. Chinese vessels have used water cannons. Chinese Coast Guard, as I told you, they have been very aggressive here against foreign vessels. They have fired water cannons at the ships belonging to Philippines in an attempt to disrupt the fishing rights of Philippines. So this is about fight for resources present in the exclusive economic zone over here. So that is why Scarborough Shoal is important. It's frequently in news. It's a flashpoint between China and Philippines. So please make a note of all these important locations. Now there are few more important islands and islets that are also disputed between Philippines and China. Why don't you find out the names of these other reefs, islands and islets that are disputed between China and Philippines and mention that in the comment section below. Apart from Scarborough Shoal, there are few other locations as well in that same region, in the Philippine Sea region, which are disputed between the two countries. So find out the names of at least two or three important locations and mention that in the comments below. So this brings our discussion to an end. Please take up these two questions for your answer writing practice. I hope all of you will attempt these questions. It's all based on what we have discussed. So write your answers and post your answers in the answer writing portal for which the link is provided in the description box below. Also head to our Telegram channel right now because we'll have a quiz on these topics. It'll help you revise these topics again. The link for Telegram channel also is found in the description box of this video. I hope you guys have liked the session. Do let me know by pressing the like button, by sharing your comments and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. So that is it for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon.